lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it ring sound loud as the rolling sea. Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, abolitionist, suffragette, poet, and author, and also Unitarian. This is the sixth in my series of Unitarians, Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists who made a difference. Harper was a Unitarian. She was also associated with the African Methodist Episcopal Church. So she did, was associated with both, but we both can claim her. She was such an excellent poet that at first I thought, well, I'm just going to stand here and read her poetry. But I know you want to know her life story as well. So we're going to try to do a little of both. Frances Ellen Watkins was born in 1825 in Baltimore, Maryland, the only child of free parents. After her mother died when she was three years old in 1828, Watkins was orphaned. She was raised by her maternal aunt and uncle, and her uncle was Reverend William Watkins, who was also a prominent civil rights activist. She was educated at his Academy for Negro Youth. Watkins was a major influence in her life. Now this is a picture I found to represent Watkins and his school. This is not actually him, but it represents him. And here are three things about this very interesting man. He was born around 1803. He attended a school founded by Daniel Coker in 1807. After Coker immigrated to Liberia to help American Colonization Society establish the new nation, 19-year-old Watkins took over as the teacher of this school. The school became Watkins Academy for Negro Youth, and it was co-ed, unlike many of the schools then that were separated boys and girls. So this was very wonderful for Frances because she was able to attend a school that not only just taught her how to sew and cook, but was wonderful in every way. He ran this school for over 20 years, educating free African-American children. He was also an AME minister. The students included his niece, the niece he was raising, Frances Ellen Watkins, and she attended to the age of 13, and that was a pretty long time to attend at that time. That was her formal schooling. Now, a little more about Watkins. Watkins disagreed with Daniel Coker, who wrote home from Liberia, Africa is a good land. Tell the people to come here and they will be happy if they will be industrious. Instead, Watkins argued that it was better to, quote, die in Maryland under the pressure of unrighteous and cruel laws than to be driven like cattle to, to the pestilential climate of Liberia. So he disagreed with Daniel Coker on that. He also became acquainted with William Lloyd Garrison, the great abolitionist who worked way back when as an apprentice at a Baltimore newspaper from 1829 to 1830. And that is when he got to know him. Garrison later credited Watkins with molding his views of colonization. So Francis Watkins, Francis Ellen Watkins, early life was filled with all this talk about abolition and about how whites and blacks might work together. Now, here's a poetry break for you. The slave auction. The sale began. Young girls were there, defenseless in their wretchedness, whose stifled sobs of deep despair revealed their anguish and distress. And mothers stood with streaming eyes and saw their dearest children sold. Unheeded rose their bitter cries while tyrants bartered them for gold. And woman with her love and truth, for these in sable forms made well, gazed on the husband of her youth with anguish none may paint or tell. And men whose sole crime was their hue, the empress of their maker's hand, and frail and shrinking children too, were gathered in that mournful band. Ye who have laid your love to rest and wept above their lifeless clay, know not the anguish of that breast whose loved are rudely torn away. 
ye may not know how desolate our bosoms rudely forced apart, and how a dull and heavy weight will press the life drops from the heart. The slave auction. When Frances was 13, she had completed by then her formal schooling. That's about as long as anybody went to school back then. She completed her formal schooling with her aunt, uncle. And she went to work. She went to work as a seamstress. Now, back then, some of the folks who could afford it would have their own seamstress in their house, their own cook in their house, all these folks. And she had learned to sew really well. So she went to work with a seamstress with a Quaker family. Again, a real plus for her. She lived with the family, and when she wasn't sewing, they gave her full access to their extensive library, which was extensive. So she got a higher education on her own by reading through that extensive library of this, wake, of this Quaker family. Here's a little about her writing career. The first volume of verse, Forest Leaves, was published in 1845 when she was just 20 years old. Her second book, Poems on Miscellaneous Subjects, 1854, was extremely popular. Over the next few years, it was reprinted numerous times and read in both the African-American community and the white community. Uh, very, very popular. In 1859, her story, the Two Offers was published in Anglo-African magazine, making her the first black woman to publish a short story. She continued to publish poetry and short stories. And here's more. She had three novels serialized in a Christian magazine from 1868 to 1888. You remember how they used to have one chapter each month and you would get it and it'd be a serialized novel over and over. She had three of those in those in a Christian magazine. She was better known, though, for what was long considered her first novel, Iola Leroy, or Shadows Uplifted, which was published in 1892. It was published as a book when she was 67, a coming-of-age story. Now, that's how old I am. I'm 67, and I think of myself as maybe middle-aged, fairly young, but when she was coming along, she was, at 67, she was a pretty old woman at 67 and was still publishing and going strong. While using the conventions of the time, she dealt with serious social issues, including education for women, passing, mis miscegenation, abolition, reconstruction, temperance, and social responsibility. Here's another poetry break, another poem. This poem is rather long. She based it on a very famous uh, slave escape. Um, so I'm just going to whet your appetite a little bit for it. I'm going to read, and I think you can tell a little bit about it from it. This is about Eliza Harris. I'm going to read the first verse, the second verse, the seventh verse, and the twelfth verse, okay? Eliza Harris. Like a fawn from the arrow startling wild, a woman swept by us bearing a child. In her eye was the night of a settled despair, and her brow was o'ershadowed with anguish and care. She was nearing the river and reaching the brink. She heeded no danger. She paused not to think, for she is a mother. Her child is a slave, and she'll give him his freedom or find him a grave. With her step on the ice and her arm on her child, the danger was fearful. The pathway was wild. But aided by heaven, she gained a free shore where the friends of humanity opened their door. With the rapture of love and fullness of bliss, she placed on his brow a mother's fond kiss. Oh, poverty, danger, and death she can brave, for the child of her love is no longer a slave. Back then, uh, if you were going to have a profession, um, there were a few opportunities for African Americans. One of them, though, was teaching. And she went into teaching and public activism. In 1850, when she was 25 years old, she moved to Ohio, where she worked as the first female teacher, first female teacher at Union Seminary, established by the Ohio Conference of the, of the American Methodist Episcopal Church. In 1853, she joined the American Anti-Slavery Society and became a traveling lecturer for the group. So shoot, they sent her all over the place 
sharing, she read poems, she lectured. In 1854, she delivered her first anti-slavery speech on education and the elevation of the colored race and continued as a traveling lecturer until 1860. What happened in 1860? A man came along. A man came along. His name was Fenton Harper. Well, she was like 40 years old by then. So she married Fenton Harper when she, uh, in 1860 when she was 40. Now, he was a widower, and he brought three older children to the marriage. She then retreated from public life, just lecturing maybe a couple times a year. She stayed at home and took care of his children. And also they had one. They had one child together in 1862, Mary Harper. She uh, bought him a farm with her money she had made. And she made extra money by, uh, she uh, churned butter and made butter for the community and sold it. So she was very industrious. He lived just four years and died in 1864. Now, I don't know, she didn't write anything about their marriage. I had a feeling it was kind of difficult, maybe. I do know that uh, after he died, he left her with great debt, or himself, he had great debt that he had accumulated. The administrator of his estate, and of course the property was in his name, you know how those things went. The administrator came, took everything away, took the farm and everything away, including her butter churns, left her with just a looking glass and the children. For a while, she tried to keep all the children with her, and, but she, her, the thing she needed to make the most money to be able to make a living was lecturing. And so eventually, they went to live with their relatives, went to live with their relatives. Um, I'm going to read a poem to you that kind of shares a little bit about this. And I don't know whether this poem was based on some of her own autobiographical kinds of things or whether it was based on the, many of the women she witnessed as she traveled around. One of the places she traveled was to the South, and she was very upset, especially Southern, and Southern women submitted themselves to beatings by their husbands, you know, just thought that was the thing to do. It was just what, what their life was like. Well, she also realized if she had died first, she said if she had died first before her husband, you know, everything had been fine, you know, because uh, he still kept the farm, kept everything, you know, probably and able to pay his debts off maybe a little time by selling some. But he died. And so she wrote this poem called A Double Standard because in her life she saw lots of double standards. It's kind of a difficult poem, but um, here it is. It's timely too, y'all. This, this poem could be read today. It could be read at the Women's March coming up next week. A Double Standard by Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Do you blame me that I loved him? If when standing all alone I cried for bread, a careless word pressed to my lips a stone? Do you blame me that I loved him, that my heart beat glad and free when he told me in the sweetest tones he loved but only me? Can you blame me that I did not see beneath his burning kiss the serpent's wiles, nor even hear the deadly adder hiss? Can you blame me that my heart grew cold, that the tempted tempter turned when he was fed it and caressed and I was coldly spurned? Would you blame me when you draw from me your dainty robes of sides if he, if he with gilded baits should claim your fairest as his bride? Would you blame the world if it should press on him a civic crown and see me struggling in the depth, then harshly press me down? Crime has no sex, and yet today I wear the brand of shame, whilst he amid the gay and proud still bears an honored name. Can you blame me if I've learned to think your hate of vice a sham when you so coldly crush me down and then excuse the man? Would you blame me if tomorrow the coroner should say a wretched girl outcast forlorn, forlorn has thrown her life away? Yes, blame me for my downward course, but oh, remember well, within your homes, you pressed the hand that led me down to hell. I'm glad God's ways are not our ways. 
He does not see as man within his love. I know there's room for those whom others ban. I think before his great white throne, his throne of spotless light, that whited sepulchre shall wear the hue of endless night. That I who failed and he who sinned shall reap as we have sown. That each the burden of his loss must bear and bear alone. No golden weights can turn the scale of justice in his sight. And what is wrong in woman's life in man's cannot be right. I think if Francis Ellen Watkins Harper were alive today, she might say, time's up, time's up, time's up. Here's some other highlights from her life. In 1858, she refused to give up her seat or ride in the colored section of a segregated car, uh, trolley car in Philadelphia. That was 100 years before Rosa Parks. In 1866, Harper gave a moving speech before the National Women's Rights Convention demanding equal rights for all, including black women. She got very involved in the suffragist movement and women's rights movements. Um, she became a little disappointed, though, a little bit later. From 1883 to 1890, she helped organize events and programs for the National Women's Christians Temperance Union. Now, you all know that a lot of our Unitarian women were involved in that. Harper was disappointed. She became very disappointed with some of the women's rights stuff. Even, and if you read about it, even some of the people that I have held up as my heroes... She became very disappointed when Millard and others gave priority to white women's concerns rather than support black women's goal of gaining federal support for anti-lynching laws, defense of black rights, or abolition of the convict lease system. As you know, even after, so this is after the Civil War, slavery was over, but it wasn't really over because all these convicts were being leased out for labor and working for free. It still isn't over. Harper helped organize then the National Association of Colored Women in 1894 and was elected their vice president in 1897. So they began to organize themselves to try to work for some things then. Harper became acquainted with the Unitarians before the war. She was working a lot with the abolitionists and a lot of them went to Unitarian churches. So she began to become friends with them and she began to go to their churches. Uh, and also, she became involved with the Underground Railway. A lot of them were involved with that. She attended Unitarian churches in Ohio and in Pennsylvania. When Harper and her daughter Mary settled in Philadelphia in 1870, she joined the First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia. This is what it looked like back then. First Unitarian Church of Philadelphia. This is her monument in a cemetery near Philadelphia. You can't read it very well, so I'll read it for you. Should, it's, it, the part of it's from a poem that was very famous she did, had. It said, I ask no monument proud and high to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slave. Francis Ellen Watkins, September 24th, 1825 to February 20th, 1911. It says, novelist, poet, abolitionist, Unitarian. Her daughter Mary is buried there as well. Here's some quotes I like to share when I share these folks with you, these famous Unitarians and Universalists and Unitarian Universalists. I always share some quotes that they had that may be just as relevant today as then. Here are some quotes from her. She said, I do not think the mere extension of the ballot a panacea for all the ills of national, our national life. What we need today is not simply more voters, but better voters. <laughs> Amen. We can say that today, quote that. No race can afford to neglect the enlightenment of its mothers. And you know, they say in these lands where they have such a difficult time, if we just educate the women, when they educate the women, that turns things around, right? Oh, could slavery exist long if it did not sit on a commercial throne? Should some of our oppressions we have today 
exist long if they did not sit on a commercial throne? She said, we want more soul, a higher cultivation of all spiritual faculties. She went on to say, we need more unselfishness, earnestness, and integrity. We need men and women whose hearts are the homes of high and lofty enthusiasm and a noble devotion to the cause of emancipation, who are ready and willing to lay time, talent, and money on the altar of universal freedom. Francis, Ellen, Watkins, Harper, we honor you today and we take lessons from your life.